Did you? <laughs> Annalise, you were in a position nobody wants to be in. Sandwiched between three cork people. <laughs> <laughs> Dear God. It's okay, I sail with a cork person every day now. Oh yeah? So, How is you know, that? It's great. You know, when we're not swimming around the place. <laughs> yeah. You might be in a good position, so to explain to us what corkness is, Annalise, since you've worked with them now. Um... So no, I, I better not say. <laughs> <laughs> you see, the fear sticks in, doesn't it? Mary, what is corkness? It's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't quite figured it out? Well, the ladies have. I'm not sure about the men. Yeah, well, <laughs> very, very true. <laughs> <laughs> Sonia, how aware were you during your career of your corkness? Well, corkness, I don't know. They used to say it was in the water, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I know we used to have quite a few good cork runners. Um, you know, you'd be competing against the same girls in the, the counties, the Munsters and the All-Ireland, so you could never get away from it. We're going to play a video in a little while. We've, over the last sort of six months, we've been building up to this night and talking to a lot of sports people and just the general public about role models and icons. And no matter who you talk to, whether it's Katie Taylor or Cora Staunton or people on the street, the one name that comes up again and again and again is Sonia O'Sullivan. Every single time. <laughs> How does that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, no, that's pretty amazing. Because pe when people ask me the question, <laughs> I never have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> You're too modest. Maybe I should just say, son, yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do get mistaken sometimes for Katrina and, um, you know, a few other names get thrown out. <laughs> Michelle sometimes. <laughs> they ask me, I mean, is that who you, is, are you Katrina? I say, no. And then most people move on. <laughs> but some will keep looking at you and then they'll eventually, eventually work it out. Yeah. Do they die of shame then once you say you're Sonia O'Sullivan? Uh, not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> Rena, how much of an icon in Cork was Sonia? Oh, she was the icon in Cork, definitely. Um, talking about role models, she was definitely my role model growing up. Probably still is, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> you can gush away now. <laughs> Now it's your chance, yeah, exactly. But actually, here's a good chance to throw it out to the crowd. Hands up here. Who had Sonia O'Sullivan as a role model at one point in life, one or another? Get your hand up. That's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> if, uh, this is going to be a great <laughs> night for your ego. <laughs> Her head won't go out the door. <laughs> We didn't have social media, so you couldn't check, you know, who was... <laughs> how many people were following you and liking you? <laughs> I, did, I threw out a thing during the week there. It was um, a race from 25 years ago. And it was just a random thing. I didn't even think, you know, what I was doing. I just kind of was away and sitting around with a few other athletes and managed to work out how to tweet a video. And... Um, <laughs> And I couldn't believe the reaction and the amount of likes and everything. And then I realized that, you know, it's, it had never been on social media. And probably a lot of my races have not been on there. So when you throw something up like that and, you know, it, it reminds people, I suppose, of what happened 25 years ago. And, and sometimes for some people, it's like it happened today. You know, they, they don't know the difference, you know. So. Well, we were just discussing it's, 1996 yeah. there. We were just talking about the Olympics. And then it suddenly dawned on both me and Nathan that we're now old because that's over 20 years ago and we still have memories mm -hmm. like it was yesterday. So like you said, a lot of those races for some people of your career, we still think of them as today and yesterday and they're great happy memories for us all, not just for you, but we look at them and we smile. Yeah, no, it, it's hard. To, it's like a quarter of a century ago. It's a, a lifetime and more for some people. So it's... Yeah. Uh, so that was yeah, it's like 25 years since the... 2,000 meters world, world record, record yeah. mm -hmm. which you still hold? Uh, outdoors. outdoors. Well, not technically, no, Damn. but um, because the IAAF decided that if you run the record indoors, it counts as an outdoor record. But, you know, indoors... Don't worry about technicalities here. Indoors, <laughs> there's, there's no wind and, you know, there's faster tracks and so they're different sports. So I say, well, it's, nobody's ever run faster outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> I think what makes Sonia really iconic is if you think of all the women in the world who run competitively, like athletics is the most played sport, for want of a better phrase, and she was one of the best. So like, that's phenomenal. And she's still remembered as one of the best. You know, I think that's really something that, should be, that we should be proud of as a country, that we have an athlete of, an athlete of Sonia's calibre, even though now she lives in Australia, we'll forgive her that. <laughs> <laughs> Not all the time. <laughs> who did you look up to then, Sonia? Who inspired um, you? Well, I think 
the people who were inspired me and were closest to me were um, one was from Cork and um, same name as me, uh, Marcus O'Sullivan, and he was um, when I was growing up. So 1987, I was just I was still in secondary school, and he was after going to win the world indoor championships. And um, I remember I was at school and I just done I think I'd done like my I think I've just finished my leaving cert and I was on my first Irish senior team, and um, Marcus was also on the team. And um, a friend of mine in school, you know, they were such big icons because the athletics was on TV all the time and, you know, in the newspapers, they were, they were big stars. And I suppose there wasn't so many other sports to compete with either. It was one of the top sports. And um, I remember one of my school friends gave me a, said to me, can you get his autograph? <laughs> <laughs> and I was so embarrassed, you know. I like one, and we'd been out for a few days in Portugal and this European competition, and then eventually I got the courage up to, you know, go and sit next to him on the bus and um, had a little piece of paper, and I said, you know, like everybody does, can you sign this for my friend? <laughs> <laughs> And, um, you know, and then, you know, down through the years, I became great friends with Marcus, you know, and we shared a lot of time together traveling on the European circuit. He helped me a lot. And then also uh, Frank O'Mara and Paul Donovan, who also had won medals at the World Indoors back then. So, yeah. yeah so when you get to meet, close. you know, people that you look up to and you aspire to be like and, and they're just normal great people then um and they, you know they made my life really easy on traveling around on the european circuit um because you know it was before phones and you know you'd be in these strange hotels and there's all these superstar athletes all around and then you'd be going down to the breakfast or the lunch and you didn't know you know you'd walk into this room and you might not know anybody and so you wouldn't know who, to, you know, if Marcus or Frank or any of them were going to be down there because you couldn't text and say, <laughs> meet you in five minutes. <laughs> and you'd go into the room and we used to have a little Irish table and, you know, we'd recruit a few Americans and there was a couple of other athletes who'd like to join you and, you know, it was me and all these men around the table. But, you know, they were kind of the people who I hung out with and they made, you know, I suppose you, you feel more comfortable when you're surrounded by people that you get on with and you can walk into a room and have a chat with. Annalise, you very similar to Sonia in that you both do solitary sports, very different sports, but the same thing. You needed, I'm assuming, a good support structure around you as well, like you said, otherwise you'd be out in a foreign country not knowing who to talk to. I mean, you had your mobile phone, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but everything else, you know, you still needed that support, I assume. Um, yeah, just having, I guess, the other sort of sailors in the Irish team that were going through the same things that I was going through. We ended up becoming very close, all of us, and the older guys in the team were able to kind of sort of mentor me along when I was starting out and young, a younger athlete. And then uh, Matt and Ryan, the two guys from uh, up north, they were both kind of the same age, going through the same stuff as me, qualifying for the first Olympics. Uh, so it was great having sort of them on the team, but then yeah, I had loads of people helping me. I, coach and sports psych and um just the whole fam my whole family as well although i'd be pretty bad at actually contacting anyone i go away and then about i'll be away for a month and my mum will send me a message are you still alive annalise <laughs> i'm like oh yeah sorry i uh, yeah i made it um uh, made it from grand she's like yeah, you made it like a month ago <laughs> <laughs> but um gets yeah, it's um it's been pretty nice change moving into a two person boat because I'm not uh you know not by myself the whole time anymore. So uh, also got a whole new sort of bundle of challenges to deal with in that I uh, I thought it was going to be, you know, it is brilliant being in a team with another person, but also um I didn't realize how selfish I was being a an individual athlete. You're an awful person when you're an individual athlete. <laughs> <laughs> it is. All you care about is yourself and you don't realise that until suddenly you're in a team with someone else and you realise that you have to be considerate for you know, another person. <laughs> this sounds like a conversation that your teammate had with you late one night <laughs> that you're just having to repeat back daily. Yeah, just, uh, you know, you could tell me when you're going to do these things, Annalise. And I'm like, oh yeah, sorry, forgot about that. Or just when we're sailing the boat and I forget to tell her that I'm going to make the boat, you know, turn the boat around. <laughs> She's like, Katie's there swimming in the water 100 metres away. She's like, what was that? I'm like, oh, sorry about that. I forgot you were with me today. <laughs> but even something as simple as getting used to having somebody else in your personal space, because those boats ain't big. 
Yeah, I actually um, headbutted Katie in the bum today and nearly knocked myself out. <laughs> Poor Katie. <laughs> it's uh, very close, uh, uh, up close in the boat, but it's, uh, it's really fun. Speaking of up close, sorry Nathan, I'm too up close to this story myself, but um, the Cork ladies, you guys understand what it's like a team environment. Yeah. <laughs> the knowing I know, smiles. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> they've agreed in advance what <laughs> stories they can share. <laughs> Yeah, we had great times. Yeah, we had, I suppose, when I was younger, I suppose I, I used to love athletics, but what veered me towards towards Gaelic Games was definitely the team environment. Basically, I, I love the crack. <laughs> that, that swung it for me. Yeah, simple as that. Simple as that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel they're holding back. In terms of, of inspiration when you were deciding to play Gaelic football, like, like, we see you probably more as trailblazers that actually ye set the bar for not just Cork, but for like ladies football, for Camogie or around the country. Did, did you feel that when you were sort of on that journey? I think Do you think a, about it? From a football point of view, Mayo were the kingpins when we really started coming to the fore. Um, and for us to beat Mayo was, we never celebrated that forever because we beat Mayo because they were so well thought of. And before that, it was Waterford. From a Camogie point of view, it was always Kilkenny. You know, that rivalry with Cork was always there and, it, and it's still there. Um, but when we were, I suppose, becoming successful, we were aware that maybe we were there to be knocked now, that we were on a pedestal. And that made you even more determined to say, well, hang on, I'm training my backside off here. I'm not going to be knocked off this. And as, as, as a team, we all had the same attitude. And I think um, we've spoken about Eamon Ryan before as a fantastic manager, but he was a brilliant people person as well. Um, he, wanted, he, he made you want to be a better player, but also to be a good person as well. And I think that's rubbed off on us even now because the panel, a lot of us have, have retired. Like I'm 10 years older than Rena, So I won my first senior all Ireland at 28. Rena was still underage, really. She was a minor. So there was a difference. But when you got, went onto the field, we were a team. We just wanted to win. And, you know, I suppose the resolve was there around that winning mentality. Like... You, know. you must have had a few rows. Absolutely, but none will tell on air. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, look, I mean, I, I, I think, do you know what, we probably would say that we were, did, we would argue over where we putting in enough effort more than anything else. Do you know what I mean? Because females being females, if you get 30 females in a dress room, you're all not going to click on a personal level. But if you think of it like that you're all mature enough that we're working together on a sporting level you just get on with it then I think that's that's the attitude we had and some of the girls are more friendly than others now off the field and but when we all meet up we're all friends because we all reminisce and I think the relentless book that Mary White um wrote although I haven't read it I must say uh, for my own reasons I don't know why I think you know for for a lot of us that'll be uh, something I'm a mentor to hold on for all the memories that we created in that time you know do you miss it um I'm retired nearly eight or nine years now, so I'm nearly there, I'm nearly okay. Uh, I did struggle, absolutely did struggle, no problem saying I did struggle, it was part of who I was, it, I let it define me for a long, long time. And when I finished, I didn't know what to do with myself, I was training six nights a week for 15 years. Um, so, you know, I, I'd grown up with being Mary O'Connor, the sports person, my mother found it really difficult as well, because <laughs> I was around more often. Um, <laughs> But, um, yeah, look, you just get on, you find new things to do. I tried to run a marathon. Running is definitely not for me. <laughs> uh, did a few cycles, but, you know, you just move on and life moves on and your priorities change as well, you know. Uh, just a reminder here, we are with three. They're a proud sponsor of the Irish women's national football team and 20 by 20. It is the reason why we're here tonight. I want to keep going on that theme, though, because it's something you touched upon, Mary, something very important in that you don't always like everyone or you don't gel as much with some people as you do with others. So how did you guys manage to ensure that that never became an issue in the dressing room? Um, I just think, in my, my opinion, I just think we all had our own... Um, we all, like Eamon used to always say to us that everybody has an ego. And he used to always say that everybody's ego needs to be massaged at different times. And that's true. And I think that's being real. Um, but I think we were just a group of players that came together and I think the specialness about the players was that we had underage players like Rena who had come through and won all Ireland's, and you had people like myself, Juliet Murphy, Valerie Mulcahy who had been playing with Cork for years and won absolutely nothing. So when we merged together, um, I think we were inspired by their no fear and we just wanted to win something, anything. <laughs> You know, I started playing and I had won a Division 4 National League and it took me nearly 10 years to win a Division 1. You know, so 
that, that kind of helped us a bit, but I can't overestimate in terms of the football side of the house, how Eamon played a huge role in that, and the selectors, Mary Collins was with him as well, really great people um, who were all in it for the right reasons, just wanted Cork to win. Where do you keep your medals? You must have the biggest mantelpiece in Ireland. <laughs> Well, mine, mine are in the museum at the moment, I think so, yeah. in Co-Park, so. Yeah, my, my medals, they're in a bag in the front room because... <laughs> <laughs> Heavy bag, in fairness. Basically, Carmel, Carmel Donovan lives across the road from us at home and um, she promised me before, before I finished up that um, when I did finish up, she was going to organise all my medals. So I said, grand. And when I finished up, I gave her the job of organising the medals. But I think herself and my father kind of ran into kind of organisational difficulties of what they wanted <laughs> to do with the medals. And there, there's a bit of a standoff at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, look, they're in a bag in the front room. They've been cleaned, I think, but that's as far as they've gotten. <laughs> You've just got to accept they're gone, though. Well, I presume they'll, they'll come to some... Um, agreement as to how to best organise them, but look, it'll take time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't break into that house anyway. Imagine a bag of medals hitting you in the back of the head. You're not going to go into that one. But yourselves, actually, ladies, as well, speaking of medals, you've got very, very special medals in your possessions, uh, Olympic medals. What have you done with them? I don't even know if I should say or, or am I one. <laughs> <laughs> I could give you Carmel's number if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bag in Cork. <laughs> 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 It's under the couch in my parents' bedroom. <laughs> my mum, she hid it there because she was afraid if the house got broken into, they might rob the, the medal. Although, like... You kind of ruined even... that. <laughs> but, but anyway, she was like, I thought they'd never look under the couch in our room. And I was like, nobody would. <laughs> they will now. <laughs> it is, it's still under the couch, yeah. She'll have to move it to, like, under a different couch or something. But um, I'm not too sure what... It probably should go somewhere or do something, but... Uh, it's, um, yeah, it probably shouldn't be just under the couch in my parents' bedroom. <laughs> Where's my yours? It, it moves around a bit. <laughs> yeah. um, the last sighting I had, um, <laughs> it was in a bag, in a bag. <laughs> and, um, I actually, um, I, I normally leave it in Cove because it's more, to me, it's more valuable in Ireland than in Australia. But then a friend of mine asked me, she said she'd never seen an Olympic medal in Australia and she runs marathons and so I brought it to Australia to show her and I still haven't showed her um, because it's in a bag, in a bag and it just was never the right moment and I, I also wanted to show it to some other people in Australia and then I brought it back from Australia in the bag because it was in my bag that I put my passport in and, <laughs> <laughs> and a really weird thing when you travel with your medal in your bag and um, you go through security every now and then you get stopped and these people, they take it out and they go, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and they get really impressed. Some of them get very impressed. Some, you know, don't care at all. But so, some, they kind of are quite amazed by it. Um, so now, so it came back to Ireland then because it was in the bag. And then the latest is, it's back in Australia again because I thought, oh, I better bring it back and show her. <laughs> Have you shown her? She still hasn't seen it. So then, because of that, I didn't bring it back this time. Um, and I've changed bags, so it's, it's in the bag, but every now and then I go and feel it to make sure it's in there. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to pick the bag up and you can feel the weight and you say, no, it's still in there. <laughs> the medal. But nobody else knows where it is, and okay. you know, even by telling you this, you still wouldn't know where it is. because <laughs> It's in a bag. You don't know where the bag is, <laughs> which, or which bag it is. <laughs> you reveal too much, Annalise. <laughs> <laughs> the, the medals obviously came after some serious heartbreak for both of you four years previously, and like, I think everybody remembers in 96 the disappointment and your dad having to come out saying look mm. nobody died and for you in 2012 when you finished fourth in London and you're onto your mom and like I think the entire nation's heart is breaking for you the disappointment like, when does that leave does it not leave till four years later is there always a part of you that's still a little bit broken um yeah I suppose when you look back at things like that you do think you could have done things differently and got a different result but then maybe it might have been, it might, it might have been a different result, but it still might not have been the result you wanted. So I think eventually you just have to park it and move on. And so, you know, back then, so now I don't even think about it. But um, in 1997, I spent all my time trying to make up for it. And, you know, every session, every run was as hard as I could. And it was constantly just banging my head against the wall. And, you know, 
not really making any kind of progress and I was just trying to match everything that I did previously. And as we all know now, if you do the same things over and over again then, and they don't work out the first time, they're not going to work out again. So eventually in 90, the end of 97, I had to decide to just stop and start all over again and just kind of, um, I suppose, put pre-96 away. So I call it like, you know, before 96 and after 96, you know. <laughs> Like BC, and <laughs> there's like two sections in there, and um, and you know it was it wasn't an easy thing to do because you know I believe what I was doing in the early 90s was was good. I mean, it got me a world championship gold medal, it got me world records, um, a whole slew of Irish records. So you kind of think you've got to do the same hard training, and so I changed coaches and just trained differently and started to get some similar results or results that I was happy with. And then once you see that and you get the motivation of getting a good result, then you know you start to believe that the work that you're doing is beneficial and it's delivering the results. So then you continue on that and you start to believe in what you're doing again. And then you forget about your old training programs and the old sessions that you did and you don't start looking back and comparing notes and you just go with this new life or new section of your career. And, um, you know, I appreciate that you're back up there competing with the best again. What about you, Annalise? Um, I'll, I'll always look back on London and maybe Rio and think, I don't know, you know, I could have won gold medals in both of them and I just... It wasn't, it wasn't that I wasn't good enough. I didn't have the, well, m mentally I wasn't good enough to do it. But like the sort of lessons I learned from London, it would, if I had won a medal there, it would have been a very easy way for me to win a medal. I started, you know, I just had a great youth career sailing and then got into seniors and started doing well straight away, qualified for the Olympics easily. I just thought it was all really easy, you know, it was, I was having a great time, I was getting to go travel around the world to these competitions, compete against the best in the world, I was just getting better all the time. And if I had won a medal in London, I think I maybe wouldn't have realised that, you know, the sort of the hard work and what I had to learn between London and Rio to be able to win a medal in Rio. So maybe I would have won a medal in London, but I might have gone to Rio and, you know, not had what it takes to have done it in Rio. So uh, probably you know, it was much more satisfying when I did manage to win a medal in Rio because everything I had to get, you know, the point I had to get to to be able to do that. It's, uh, but it's, you know, I, was, I guess everyone's probably similar. Like, you know, after 2012, I was just like, I'm just going to train like a maniac. And I trained like a maniac for a year and it was great. And then... I didn't want to train at all. I was completely burnt <laughs> out. <laughs> um, so, you know, that it was a car crash then 2014. And then I basically spent the next two years trying to sort of build myself back up again. But it's, uh, you know, you have these ideas in your head of what, what you're going to do, but what's actually sustainable and, you know, what, what isn't is a, it's kind of a learning process. And you have all the best help in the world around you. But, you know, when you just think you know what's best, uh, nobody can really change your mind. Like I'd be off doing sneaky training sessions and not telling anyone about them and just, uh, you know, now I've learned much better, you know. <laughs> like sure? if, if there's the training session isn't on my programme, I don't need to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Mary and Rena, I suppose you've alluded to a little bit, Mary, how it wasn't always plain sailing to be a female athlete in Cork, even though we may have this perception that you win things all the time. Um, it probably wasn't as easy as Rena made it look to be winning all those All Irelands. I'm sure lessons have been learned along the way and challenges Rena as well. I'm sure. Ah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, ov obviously, I was saying that the reason I went to a team sport was because because of the fun. But I suppose half the fun is that you know, in the you know, you're putting in a huge effort with someone and you have someone to to complain about how hard training is. <laughs> Um, and then if things don't go well, you know, you have someone to kind of throw the arm around your shoulder and you have someone to chat to and everything like that. You know, you know I suppose we were, in the football in particular, we went through a, a huge transition um, in terms of professionalism, really. Um, 
like I can remember the first time we were on we were on television in 2004. It was a huge, huge occasion. We even got to get a jersey. I think after the game, we were absolutely thrilled. And this was a this was a huge occasion in our lives. Like I was just thinking back. I was 17. I don't know if it was as big an occasion for you at 27, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a huge occasion in my life anyway. Um, <laughs> But yeah, there was a huge amount of work and there was a huge probably cultural shift as well um, that came from, from management, um, from county board level and from the players ourselves. You know, things might have been a little bit slacker, um, but there was a huge shift in terms of professionalism and I think the standard of ladies, ladies GA has, has improved hugely probably because of that. Yeah, I think what, following off what Rena's point is, you know, the, the attitude of professionalism definitely changed in, in, in us, but, you know, we were still very agricultural in terms of our, our prep, like we used to have these empty bins as ice baths. Frankie, the selectory was big, a big pot of soup in the middle of the dressing room, but it was brilliant because it was a kind of a communication piece. We all sat around having soup after training and talking. I still... Nine years after I retire, still have these nightmares about these all these all black runs we used to, and you go down to the pitch and say, "Oh, the pitch is lined out for the all black runs," because you knew your stomach was going to be in a heap because they were just torture. And you know, and sometimes Eamon used to come down and do a, down to the field, his little butter box of a car, and all you could see was football flying out of it, and he'd have simply the best plane coming down, <laughs> <laughs> and we'd be all like, oh, I'm mortified, here he is, but like, it was all psychological with him, like, you know, and like, we used to do the bleep test, one of the selectors used to walk in between us with the cassette player playing the bleep test, like, <laughs> that's been genuine, but we didn't care, as far as we were concerned, we were training as hard as we could, and, you know, I think that's when we got to Crow Park and I was finished that year, but when Cork were the 10 points down, I think that showed the resolve because they knew how hard they had trained and what they put into to get where they were. And they said, well, we're going to make sure that we perform on the pitch. And I think when Cork performed, that's when they had success, you know. Just to let you know, we have a competition for everybody here tonight with thanks to our friends at Three. We're giving everyone here a chance to become a mascot for the Euro 2021 qualifier against Montenegro in Tala on the 3rd of September. That's everybody here. Everybody here gets the chance. Louise, you don't mind walking on to the pitch with any of these people, no? It's all fine? It's all fine. The prize is four general admission tickets, including one for the mascot, uh, a boy or girl between seven and 11 years of age, Aww. and their parents or guardians. To be able a chance of winning, just tell us who your role model is on Twitter using the hashtag can't see can't be so you can do that now it'll be somebody in this room who wins that prize we'll let you know a little bit later on you've got to rush back to cork can't spend too yeah, much time in dublin absolutely you've got to rush back. <laughs> mary just before you go you obviously have a different role as the ceo of the federation of irish sports we're what almost a year into 20 by 20 attendance participation visibility is everything going the way you would have wanted to yeah have there's a lot of hard work going on uh, in behind the scenes by the national governing bodies of sport and the local sports partnerships who signed up to the 20 by 20 charter. Um, and uh, along with Sharon O'Connor, the campaign manager for 20 by 20, there's a lot of things happening. We've got a fantastic summer of sport. There's been huge initiatives already. The first ever women in sport calendar uh, for Ireland was produced earlier this year. So people know when events are on. I think that's important. If we want people to go to events, they need to know when they're on. Um, so we're, we're working on different um, events and initiatives. So ask people to keep an eye out um, on the Twitter uh, account at 20by20.ie. Um, there's Instagram and Facebook, but don't ask me about it, I haven't a clue. <laughs> uh, but yeah, look genuinely, it's a fantastic campaign. We, Federation of Irish Sport, firmly believes in it. Um, and I know the national governing bodies are really, really enjoying being part of it as well. Um, and just say, yeah, get involved, um, become involved. It's very simple. All right, very good. Give it up for our guests this evening, Sonia O'Sullivan, Annalise Murphy, Rena Buckley and Mary O'Connor. <laughs>